Today we're going to take a look at Isotope's new system audio tool called Audio Lens. The kind people at Isotope did send this to me a few days ago, but I guess there's no need for disclaimers because it's free, or at least it will be free for another two weeks. And I got the release date wrong. It's actually yesterday, so there are a dozen videos out there already about this, but I have been using it ever since I installed it, so I thought I would share my experience with you. In a nutshell, it's software that captures the audio before it goes to your speaker. So it captures anything from Spotify, from iTunes, from YouTube, whatever is playing back on your machine, and it gives you a visual reference. If you're familiar with tonal balance control, another Isotope product, this will look familiar to you. It also captures dynamic range and stereo width information, but you don't access that until you get into other products like Ozone or Neutron, and I'll talk about that later. I'm currently using my iPad as an external display through Sidecar on my Mac, and I've got audio lens up all the time, and it's been up for three days. But what I like about having it on the iPad is that it's always there, even when I'm switching around Windows, and you don't have to run this inside a DAW. I don't think it will work inside a DAW. Maybe it will. It will not. I'll check on that. If you're new to my channel, I am a production music composer, which means I write in all types of styles and genres, and I mix and master all types of styles and genres from other people. So I don't have like one go-to sound. If I did, everything would sound just like me. I'm always trying to figure out how to make a piece of music work in its particular genre. And to do that effectively, I need reference tracks. Before streaming, this was much easier. You know, I would take a CD and I would switch back and forth between the CD audio. I've also used a handful of plugins. Magic AB is one that's really nice, but I don't buy much music anymore. I need to get reference tracks from everywhere. And sometimes the only place to get that is YouTube. In order to not get a copyright strike, I'm gonna cycle through some of the tracks that are in my own production music library. I just wanted you to see this white line and the way that it respond with input material. Over here, you see my targets. And the way I got those is I pulled up Spotify. I found a piece of audio that I liked and that I wanted to reference. And I got these references from my friend, Michael Curtis, by the way. Michael Curtis is an old friend of mine. He used to live here in Dallas, but he's moved away, which is very sad. He's a mastering engineer, but he's also got a great YouTube channel on live sound, which I'm amazed at how little I know about live sound after 20 years. I mean, the speakers are really heavy and uh, it's super loud. It's just not my thing. But he made a video years ago that I reference all the time, which is about reference tracks. And he goes in depth on why he uses certain tracks as reference. I highly recommend it. So let me play back one of my tracks here. <laughs> I'm going to call this Throw Me Away so that I remember to throw it away. Now, when you click on where it says throw me away, you can see the frequency spectrum of that particular track. Michael also recommended get lucky for the low frequency and also the high frequency, the hi hats. He has all these reasons in his video. Uh, Midnight by Coldplay is one of my favorites because it's got that deep bass and you can see it there. Phoenix is a track that Michael mastered and he talks about the reasons why again. Vultures by John Mayer, not John Mayer, I get the jokes. Let me show you how I have been using it. I'm working on this album of tracks that are orchestral, but with a drum kit, which is a kind of odd combination. My friend David wrote these string parts that sound like this. It's supposed to be super happy and encouraging and uh, motivating. And I, briefly, I'll play the drums. I'm still a little insecure about my drums, but I'm, but I'm getting better. The only track that I could think of in a short amount of time that kind of matched the strings and pop drum sound was Viva La Vida by Coldplay. So I went and captured the instrumental section of that where it was biggest. And I got this curve that you can see in audio lens. Now, if I compare that to Midnight by Coldplay, dramatic low end difference there. So you could tell what they're trying to do is feature the strings. And so I'm trying to copy that. If we listen to my in progress mix, you get this. If I mute my bass, if I mute the strings,
is this the way the mix needs to sound at the end? I'm not 100% sure. I'm just now kind of getting started with it. But this puts me in the ballpark. I'm normally going to mix my kick a little bit stronger and the bass a little bit stronger, a little more high end on the top. But for this particular style of music, this kind of guides me in the process of getting a sound that might be more effective for this genre. Now, that's just the frequency spectrum. If I go into Ozone and I hit the Mastering Assistant and... I made a video last month about the new Ozone, which I really like. And I also have affiliate links for a handful of these Isotope and... How am I forgetting? Native Instruments. Which is now part of the same company. If you use my links, I get a percentage of the sale, so I would greatly appreciate that. Also, like and subscribe. I never ask you to do it. That helps. If you click on this button, now we have access to all of my captured targets which is awesome the way these work together. Now, you might have to do some work if you're a Mac person in the security preferences, security and privacy to make sure that these talk to each other properly, or at least I had to with the pre-release, but you're probably used to that if you use a Mac. I can take the mastering assistant and look at it based on these curves. And you can see that my mix... <laughs> If we go and look at what it's doing, it feels like mine doesn't have enough top end and enough bottom. And so it's matching that, but it's fairly close. It is also taking that dynamic information that it captured and using that information to help stabilize it, which it's using the assistant here, which is an EQ that kind of changes depending on the source material. Of course, I'm saying that wrong. Impact will look at the dynamics in these four different frequency areas. And then you have the imager and dynamic EQ. And the dynamic EQ, from what I understand, is not informed by the AI. I'm not using that term correctly, but it just helps to uh, tame some of the frequencies before it hits the maximizer. You can also do this on a per track basis in Neutron, but I really don't use Neutron. At least I don't use it yet. So I won't show you that, but it works the same way. I love this new generation of visual tools. Now you have to rely on your ears. You need to train your ears. However, when it comes to translating from one space to the next, well, that involves a lot more. There's acoustic treatment. There's the speakers that we have, the headphones. So these visual tools help us understand how the music might sound elsewhere. And when I can see what I hear, that's just another way that's gonna get me closer to producing the type of music that I wanna make. It's free, so I think it's a no brainer to give it a shot at least. Go download it and then watch my in-depth look at Ozone 10. Talk soon.